There is a crisis of fatherhood in America. I recently learned that almost one out of four kids in our country grows up without a dad in his home. Wow, one in four. For the kids who do have contact with their dad, the average uh, amount of time, one-on-one conversation that a schoolboy has with his dad every week is 30 minutes a week. And so, okay, so if that's, you know, 30 minutes of good one-on-one conversation, that's awesome. But con- contrast that with 44 hours a week of screen time for the same kids. So 44 hours with the TV, a, a computer, other devices, 30 minutes conversation with a dad on average. The, the absence of dads takes a toll on kids. They, uh, uh, there are just so many more challenges. It's like, it's like roadblocks are set in front of kids with, with no dad presence in their lives. It's, there are more challenges at school, more challenges with behavior, challenges on every side for kids that don't have a dad's, a father's presence in their lives. And then you add to that, it seems like sometimes, I don't know if this is true, but it seems like there's just sort of a, a campaign out there against fatherhood, a campaign opposing fatherhood. Like you can really see it in the media and in entertainment. I, I, I'm old enough to remember TV before and TV after that just seemed like there was a change in the writing, like for sitcoms, where all of a sudden the dad, where the dad used to be sort of the symbol of, of authority and care and provision and, and even discipline. Now, uh, in, in recent decades, the dad on sitcoms is usually the butt of all the jokes. He's the dumb one. He's the one that never gets it right. He's the one that always forgets everything. Like, that is not how dads are, but it seems like there's just this campaign. And then there are, there, there are, are things that maybe it's not really a, an attack, but the systems are set up so that appointments for health care, family services, school appointments, they're during the day when many dads are working. So even if there's a dad in the home, it, it's like this, the things are just set up so that in many cases, dads feel like outsiders or outcasts. And you'll see where I'm going with this in a, in a minute. I'm just thinking back uh, about my own life. When I was six, my parents divorced and my dad left our house. My mom remarried and had many, uh, we had many good years with my stepdad, but then he left about a month before I graduated from high school. And so I, I, I just went through my whole life feeling abandoned by my father. And, and I felt that hole. I felt it. And so uh, for, it, it worked itself out in, in many ways in me. Uh, I was looking for approval and fulfillment, sometimes in all the wrong places and all the wrong things. I, I know that I had a hole in my heart where that was supposed to be filled by a dad. And I, I remember that I, in my college years, I had many regrets, but I'm so thankful that my grandparents introduced me to Jesus when I was little. And I always knew Jesus was there, that, that he um, was my Savior. But one of the special things for me, in my, just in my prayer life throughout my life, is praying to my Father. And I always realized that I do have a Father. I have a Heavenly Father and I'm so thankful for that because that, that really did make the difference. And I, I always knew that if I would just settle down, I did have a father to talk to. I did have a father who could protect me. I did have a father who could guide me. I did, my heavenly father. And I realized that in, in, to a certain extent, Jesus was fathering me. And that leads me to today's scripture. It's in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. And if you want to look there, it's the scripture that that we've been using um, during this series of messages this Christmas. 
Isaiah 9-6, is, it's where it's written down that Isaiah was just a, a godly man, a prophet. Isaiah prophesied about the amazing child who would be born, the Messiah, the anointed one of God. And he prophesied many years, hundreds of years before he came. And this is what he wrote down, Isaiah 9-6. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And now we can look back. Isaiah was, was writing this hundreds of years before he came, but now we can look back and see that Jesus is that Messiah that was promised. Jesus is the one who is Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. These verses that Isaiah wrote, Isaiah 9, 6, and the verses before and after it, were written about Jesus. And so this is the one message from this series about these names that he will be called that I, that I was kind of scratching my head on coming up to it. Because Jesus is called Everlasting Father. So if Jesus is the Son of God, how can he be called Everlasting Father? Is Jesus fatherly? How so? Does Jesus have the solution to the crisis of fatherhood that we're facing? So I want to I look at some of those questions today and, and bring, bring you some answers. So if Jesus is the Son of of God, we're all we're all clear on that. If you've ever heard someone uh, talk about his titles, you've heard them say "Son of God." If Jesus is the Son of God, how can he be called the Everlasting Father? Well, when Isaiah wrote this, hundreds of years before Jesus came to Earth, he took uh, he was born as a baby on Christmas, but grew up to be the Savior of the world. Isaiah, when Isaiah was not thinking Trinity, no one, no one was. <laughs> Back in the day, we were not thinking Trinity. Trinity meaning God is three in one. Only one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's the Trinity. That word's not even in the Bible, Trinity, by the way. We just see God the Father, we see God the Son, and we see God the Holy Spirit in the Bible. So Isaiah was not thinking Trinity. So when, when he said that, you know, God revealed to him that this, this child was coming, uh, he, he, he just said, God has told me, that there's coming a human child, a baby is going to be born, and he's going to be called by these names, including Everlasting Father, Everlasting Father. And last week we talked about Mighty God. So this is a human baby that's coming, but he's also God. Wow, mind blown. But Isaiah just took all that by faith, and he said, God's told me this, I'm, I'm writing it down, and I, I'm sharing it with people. So Isaiah was not talking about Jesus' role in the Trinity. He wasn't saying he's God the Father. What he was describing was the character of the Messiah to you and to me. And all these four names that, that uh, Jesus was prophesied about, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, they describe how the character of the Messiah, how Jesus is to us. So these are not names like, um, like, a, like a given name, like a first name. It's like, okay, Q Mary. Hey, wonderful counselor, get in here, time for dinner. Like, that's not the kind of name we're talking about. Not like, not like a name you would say, hi, wonderful counselor, hey, WC. It was not like that. It is describing his character, who he is, his essence, how we receive him, how we interact with him. We interact with Jesus as mighty God, as everlasting father. And that's what we're talking about today, everlasting father. So these names show how and what Jesus will be for you and for all God's children if you let him into your life. So I, I want to look at Jesus' fatherly treatment to us. And uh, really, there's, there's many different ways, but you know, I, I have to limit the, the scope of, of how much I talk about it at any one given time. So here's the bottom line of this message. Jesus reveals... The heart of the Father for you. 
and that uh, for you can be taken a couple different ways. Jesus reveals the heart of the Father for you. Jesus himself said, and it's written down in John, it's another place in the Bible, John chapter 10, verses 30 and 38. Jesus said, the Father and I are one. And that's right. There's only one God. God in three persons. God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But there's only one God. And Jesus said, the Father and I are one. Skipping down to verse 38. But if I do his work, the Father's work, Believe in the evidence of the miraculous works I've done. Even if you don't believe me, then you will know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. In another place in John 14, Jesus replied, Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So first of all, one layer is that Jesus did the Father's work. He did the mission that that the Father sent Jesus here to do. So Jesus went around teaching about what God God meant and intended for our lives, uh, how he wants us to live. He went around healing, uh, delivering people from oppression of, of the enemy. He did miracles. He forgave sins. All of this work that Jesus did, all of the Father's work that he did, reveals to you and to me the heart of the Father for you. Uh, that he, he shows us, as he is fathering us, he is showing us what the Heavenly Father is like. He is the Heavenly Father with skin on. And he's showing us God wants you healed, well, restored, guided, provided for. That, that is how the Father is. And so that is, uh, that is uh, some of the ways that Jesus is fatherly towards us. And so I, I'm going to drill down and look at four specific ways. And I encourage you always to take notes. Uh, I, I feel like you retain things. You can look things up later. You can be reminded of things. But take notes on your phone. Take notes uh, on a pad, a paper, whatever. What do you got? So first way, how is Jesus fatherly? How is Jesus fatherly towards you and me? Well, he's your provider. He's your provider. In another place in the Bible, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, it says, and this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. God is your provider, and, and, and Jesus is your provider. That is a fatherly thing to do, to provide for a family. And that is the right character uh, to, to focus on for, for fathering that's, that's the imaging of, uh, image of fathering that I wish we would focus on as a society. And God is our role model. So Jesus is saying things over your life right now. He's saying, my child, don't worry. I have all the riches in glory. I have plenty for you, and I've got a good plan for you. Trust me. I am your provider. Go to me first when you're stressing over finances or other types of provision, a place to live, clothes to wear, transportation. When you're stressing over those things, Jesus is saying, I want to provide for you. Now, if you never had a need, you would never have a reason to pray and and draw close to Jesus. Sometimes the need is what gets you on your knees. (laughs) Wow, I just made that up, and that is so powerful. <laughs> the need gets you on your knees. Woo! So there is actually a benefit sometimes to having a little bit of a need or having even a big need. I have had a big need many times in my life. And looking back, I can see, wow, okay, it wasn't always instantaneously. It wasn't the second I prayed, but God led me through a process, and he provided And I can look back through my whole life and say, God provided. There was no way I could go to college. And doubly, no way I could go to a private school, a Christian school. Yet I did. God provided. And that's just just one of the things, so many things I can think back over my life. God is your provider. Jesus is your provider. And that is one of the fatherly things that Jesus does for you. He is your provider. And so Jesus reveals the heart of the Father for you as your provider. A second thing uh, that it just occurred to me from God's word, uh, a fatherly thing that Jesus does, he's your protector. A good father is a protector, not an abuser. 
So let's picture a good father when we think of Jesus being everlasting father to us. In John chapter 10, verses 28 to 30, Jesus said, he's talking about people who believe in him, I, I gave them eternal life and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me. For my father has given them to me and he is more powerful than anyone else. No one can snatch them from the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. So Jesus says, no one can snatch believers from me. And he says, and no one can snatch them from the Father. And by the way, the Father and I are one. So he is just simply saying, God is your protector. And that's one of the ways that Jesus is everlasting Father to you and to me. He's a protector. In Hebrews 13, verse 6, it says, So we can say with confidence, The Lord is my helper, so I will have no fear. What can mere people do to me? So I just read some verses about Jesus saying, The enemy is not going to get you. I am stronger than the enemy, and I am going to protect you. And then he says, And by the way, what can people do to you? The worst, if they did the worst, if you're a believer in Jesus, and someone killed you, now you're in heaven. So like, the, if, that, like the, if the very, very, very worst extremist thing happened, you're still good. And now suddenly you're face to face with Jesus in peace and holiness and wholeness of body. Like, wow! So God's got you. Jesus, one of the fatherly things he does for you is he is your protector. So Jesus right now is speaking over your life. I've got you. I've got you. Do not be afraid. Do not fear. Trust in me. Hold on to my hand. Let's go through life together. Anything that happens to you, uh, any temptation that comes your way, I'm going to make a way out. Any torment that comes to you, I am your peace. I am your answer. Wow. Jesus, one of the fatherly things he does for you is he is your protector. And he reveals the heart of the Father for you as protector, as your protector. A third way is he is your corrector. <laughs> so he's your provider, protector, and corrector. Am I right, Steve-O? <laughs> My son is here. <laughs> yeah. So hopefully you remember more of the provision and the protection than the correction. Yeah. Um, he is your corrector, and that is one of the fatherly things that Jesus does. As everlasting father, he's your corrector. In Hebrews chapter 12, I'm listing lots of names. You might not be familiar with those names. They are places in the Bible, all right? So Hebrews chapter 12, verses 6 and 10. For the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes each one as he, that he accepts as his child. Now, if you had a bad experience with an abusive father, when you hear discipline, like some of you just amened, and I'm, I'm guessing that you either have a good experience with God the Father or you had a good experience with your earthly father. For some of you that didn't, if, if your earthly father was abusive, when you hear discipline, you might just recoil at that. Oh, wow, I, do, I don't want God to discipline me. But listen to the next verse in verse 10. But God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in his holiness. God's discipline is not to smack you down. God's discipline is to bring you closer to him, that you would share in his holiness. It's, it's God saying, hey, this is in the way of our relationship. I've got to correct that. That's got to be gone because that's getting in the way of our closeness. Let's get rid of that through discipline. Let's get rid of that so we can be closer. Do you see the difference? It's very good. It's very positive and it's very helpful. I don't know if you can think back on any, um, a, a, any discipline that you received from a teacher, parent, grandparent, whatever, as you're growing up. And can you look back and say, oh, I'm really glad they kind of shaved that off of my life because that was hurting me or I was hurting others. I, I, it was hurting my relationships. That's the way it is with God. When he disciplines you, he's saying, wow, you're my child. I only discipline my children. You're my child. I care about you. I want you to live the best life possible. I, I want you to, have, to be successful in all your endeavors. So we got to discipline some of this stuff out of your life. 
So Jesus is speaking to you right now, and he's saying, I love you too much to let you keep going with that. Now, sometimes we people, we get into it and we go, well, if I were God, (laughs) I'd be putting that out in this person (laughs) because that is glaring. But you know what? God is a little bit wiser than us, and he has an order of things. And sometimes, not always, but sometimes God goes for this simplest small thing first, not the glaring thing, so that you and I will learn to trust him as a good, good father. And as we trust him, then we would be willing to let go of some other things or to take up some discipline like reading God's word or praying regularly or different things like that that are going to be helpful for us. So Jesus reveals the heart of the Father for you as your corrector. That's part of it. And then the last one that I came up with, uh, there's, there are so many more in the Bible, but I just, I just had to narrow it down. Jesus is fatherly. He's your encourager. He's your encourager. And I hope that my kids felt encouraged by me. Uh, I, 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 I love, as a dad, to be able to encourage. Psalm 103, verses 13 to 17 says, The Lord is like a father to his children. Listen to these. Tender and compassionate to those who fear him. And I don't know how you picture God. Picture him this way. Tender and and compassionate to you. That's how he is. That is how he is fatherly to you. For he knows how weak we are. He remembers we are only dust. Okay, you have perfect Jesus, glorified, worshipped by heaven and earth, and yet he remembers, hey, I have flesh and bones too. I, I, I know how it felt. I know the weaknesses. I know the limitations. And he remembers that. And, and he, he loves you as a tender, compassionate father, even through your weaknesses. Verse 17, but the love of the Lord remains forever with those who fear him. His salvation extends to the children's children. So here are the types of things that Jesus is speaking over your life right now. I know you stumbled. But get back up. Let's go. It's okay. Dust off. I've not abandoned you. I still love you. It's okay. We can do this again. Let's try again. Come on, get up. Let's go. And and he's also saying to you that I've got your back. I've got you. I know this last week was rough. I know this last month was rough. I've got you. Let's go together. You can make it. You can make it all the way to the end. You can put, keep your faith in me all the way to the end of your life. You can have eternal life forever. Come on, you can make it. You can do it. This is what Jesus is speaking over your life right now. And that is awesome to me to think that Jesus reveals the heart of the Father for you as your encourager. Uh, I, I'm, I'm so thankful that Jesus has been my everlasting Father So, you know, I'm not supplanting God the Father. But one of Jesus' roles, one of his, um, uh, the way way that he interacts with us is fatherliness. And I'm I'm so thankful that God is my Father. Uh, Jesus also gave me some tangible gifts here on earth. So I, you know, I can't see him with my physical eyes, but I can talk to him and he can talk to me through prayer. But he also gave me some, some just fatherly gifts here on earth. I, I remember when I was in high school, my pastor, I was just in the right place at the right time. I was at the right church at the right time. My, fa- my pastor took me under his wing. I was graduating. It's probably the, the biggest turning point in anyone's life when you're leaving, uh, leaving high school. And now am I going to go to this school, that school? Am I uh, go straight to a job? What am I going to do? And he counseled me through it. And he said, Garen, Give me one year for you at a Bible school. Get yourself in a place where people are praying about their future, not just studying classes. For that, this is what he saw in me. That's not, this is not advice for everyone, but his advice for me was, Garen, give me one year. I will never forget it. Give me one year at a Christian school. And so I went to Northwest College of the Assemblies of God up in Kirkland, and that one year led to uh, uh, becoming a pastor at a very young age, going back, finishing my degree, so many things. And I would say 
I'm here right now as your pastor in part because he fathered me, was someone that God, my father, gave me here on earth as well. But he even went beyond that and he redeemed my relationships with my earthly dads. They, they may not have ever been exactly what I pictured, but now I can look back. There, there are a couple of moments that are so amazing. If you've been with me for a while, you've, you've heard this before, but there, I, I, I went to um, my niece's graduation at the Tacoma Dome, and I had not seen my stepdad that left when I was in high school. I had not seen him for years like a few decades, I would think, by then, maybe two or three decades. Um, and I saw him, I, I, I saw him coming, um, you know, it's a huge parking lot. I saw him, saw him coming from a long ways up. He, he came up to me. He grabbed me in a big old hug. He kissed me on my cheek. That is a kiss I will never forget. And he said over and over again, Garen, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Garen, I'm sorry, Garen, I'm sorry, Garen, I'm sorry, Garen, I'm sorry, Garen. That is a moment I will never forget. And that was a moment that my Father in heaven gave me on earth. I also had an opportunity, uh, Pastor Shelley and I, just a few years ago, maybe three years ago, something like that, to see my, my birth dad. And I had not seen him for decades, literally. So that'd be like three or four decades. Three, yeah, three decades for him. Um, and, and, it was a very interesting, it was an interesting meeting. It was an interesting dinner that we had together. But what I came away with from that was, ah, I understand him now. I understand why he was absent. And it's not because I'm bad. It's because of his deal. That was a gift to me. And I am so grateful to God for it. But there's more. Best of all, he gave me a stepdad who is a father to me now. And he is Jesus with skin on. And this fall, he moved next door. So my parents are right next door to us now. So I get to see him all the time. And I am so grateful. And now I'm a father myself and a grandfather of five. And I now know that I can look back over my life and realize oh, I was never abandoned by Jesus. He really is my everlasting father. I was never abandoned by God the Father. And God the Father, God the Son are one. I know that. All those years I was praying to him, he was there and he was answering and he was working things out in his time and in his way. And I, I am so blessed and so happy about that. So does Jesus have the solution to solve your fatherhood crisis? Yes. Jesus reveals the heart of the Father for you. And I didn't say to you, for you. Because the heart of the Father is for you. He is for you, not against you. He wants to provide for you when you need something. He wants to protect you when the enemy torments you, when the devil torments you, or when people attack. He wants to correct you when you get off course. And he wants to encourage you when you're down. Would you stand to your feet? And I'd love to just give you an opportunity to respond to this message today. Would you, whether you're in the room or online, would you raise your hand to say, I want prayer. That's what the hand raises. But raise your hand if you need Jesus to be your everlasting father in some way. You need his fathering. You need his provision, protection, encouraging, or correction. You need it. My hand's out because I do need Jesus to be my everlasting father still. 
And I just want to pray for you. Most of our hands are up, and that is, it is a human need. Yes, let's pray. Jesus, I just want to thank you so much that you came and that one of the ways you interact with us is you show us the heart of the Father and you father us, Jesus. You father us. You're the Father with skin on. You father us. And so, Lord, I want to pray right now, Lord, for the people who are raising their hand in the room or online who need your provision. There's a need in their life, a need for healing or finances or, or wisdom or something, but they, there's, there's a need that they have that they need you as their father to provide. And I just pray, Jesus, you would father us right now and that you would provide for that need. Lord, some of us are going through torment. Some of us are going through what seems just like an attack of the devil. Some of us are, are being lashed out at by people. Uh, some of us are, are getting the silent treatment for people. Lord, we just need you. We need your protection. And I just pray, Lord, for every one of us that's in that category, Lord, that you would just help us to draw close to you, to feel your embrace, to feel your strength, carrying us through the hard times, through the challenges that we're going through. And Lord, I just pray right now you would father us, Jesus, in this area. Lord, I pray that you would also correct us. Some of us even raised our hand knowing that's what I need is some correction because I feel like I'm just sort of wandering or that I'm, I'm going down a dangerous path. Lord, for that person, I pray for your correction because your correction is not abusive. Your correction is helpful. Your correction gets stuff out of, our, out of our lives and out of our way so that we can just be close to you. So Jesus, correct us as a father would, I pray. And finally, Lord, I just pray for encouragement. Lord, for those who need that right now in this season, in this time, uh, even today specifically, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would father us with encouragement right now. Lord, I pray that we would just begin to hear you say through your word, through worship songs, you've got our back, you're for us, we're going to make it. And Lord, I just declare in Jesus' name, we are going to make it. We're gonna, we are going to make it. We are going to stay faithful to you till the end and enjoy eternal life with you forever. Hallelujah. Lord, thank you. Thank you. You can put your hands down for a sec, but there's something else I want to ask you about praying for you. Jesus reveals the heart of the Father to you, men who are fathers, so that you can be a good father. It's tough. And I just barely scratched the surface at the beginning of this message. It's like everybody, it seems like in society, is against us dads. They're against the concept of fatherhood in general. But I want you to know there's a loving father who is a good example. There's God the Father, and there is Jesus fathering us and fathering you. And I just wanted to specifically speak to dads today and, and just say that, you know, maybe through a renewed relationship with Jesus or through some unexpected regular person around you, like God's done both for me, that he would help you be a good father. And I'm just curious if there's any, any fathers here in the room or online that would say, I need Jesus to help me be a good father. Would you raise your hand? And I do. Every, every phase of, of fatherhood is just a little bit different. And uh, many times I don't do the Jesus thing and I have regrets. So I just want to pray for you fathers, and many of us just raising our hand. I, I, I feel like we're in this together, guys. And Lord, I just lift us up. I lift all the dads right here, especially those who are raising their hand to you. And Lord, I, I just pray that you would, as we read your word, as we read the Bible, Lord, I pray you would show us how you father us and help us to do that. I pray that you would correct us when we get off track as a father and show us a better way is there, is there a better way than yelling or abusing or hitting, calling names? Is there a better way? I believe there is. But we need you to show us because, Jesus, many of us only heard those ways. So I just pray for every father. I pray you bless them. Jesus, I pray you would lead them. I pray that you would encourage them. I pray you give them wisdom. So when their kids do ask for wisdom, we dispense godly wisdom. I pray you give us everything that we need for life and godliness as a father. Empower the fathers with your Holy Spirit, I pray. 
in Jesus' name. Amen. One final thing I want to invite you um, to, to pray about today. And I don't know, men or women, young or old, I don't know where you are in your relationship with Jesus. So I've just talked for a very long time about how Jesus wants to father you in the best possible way. But do you know Jesus? Have you put your faith in him? Have you given him your life? Are you following him? I want to invite you to do that today. How do you do that? Turn away from your sin. All those things that separate you from God and separate you from the Father. And turn the other way. Turn towards Jesus. Give your life to Jesus. And let him lead. Let him be your Father. Let him lead you and steer your life and give you your mission and your purpose. Would you bow your heads for just a moment? And if today you want to put your faith in Jesus to become a Christian, maybe you're coming back to Jesus. Maybe you never put your faith in him before. Either way, if, if you're ready to do that today, whether you're online or in the room, would you raise your hand? And that's just a signal to me, just like we've been doing. Pastor, pray for me. Yeah, I, I, I'm seeing hands go up, and that is so powerful. This is the best day of the year to give your life to Jesus, put your faith in him. So what I'd like to do, there's so many people making this decision today. I'd love to coach you in a prayer. And church, would you help me out? If, if, you are, if you're raising your hand, you're saying, yes, I'm putting my faith in Jesus today. Would you repeat after me a prayer, but say it to Jesus. Okay, here we go. Repeat after me. Jesus, Jesus. I invite you into my life. I acknowledge I'm a sinner. So please forgive me of my sin and make me new. I choose to give you my life and let you lead. Starting now, be my father in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And you know what's cool? We just say welcome to the kingdom of God. Welcome to the family of God. When you pray that prayer, 100%, of the time, the answer is yes. There's other stuff that we say, Lord, I would like a big pile of money right now. Ah, the answer's not always yes. <laughs> but when you pray, Jesus, forgive me of my sin, it's yes. Amen. You are forgiven. And some of you need to say right now out loud, and maybe we could all do this together, I am forgiven, I am forgiven. I am forgiven. of my sin, oh, by, sin. Jesus. by Jesus. Amen. Amen. Woo! <laughs> so now it's the last part of that prayer we need to learn how to follow jesus we've got a course for you and pastor christian will tell you a little bit more about that thanks pastor garen yeah. thank you for painting such a beautiful picture of the father and an accurate picture a true picture of, of who he wants to be for us thank you i was i'm gonna go in the puddle and cry now <laughs> oh man that blessed me so deeply uh, well, at this time, our ushers are going to be coming down the aisle to collect those Connect cards. If you haven't filled those out, you have about 0.5 seconds to do so. Um, get writing. And then um, also, uh, we, we want to invite you once again. We're just going to be spending some time in the lobby, singing a couple of Christmas carols. Just a great time to be a church family together. I invite you to come join us for that. It'll be a great time. And then God bless. Oh, yeah. And then we will see you next Saturday, this Saturday for our Christmas Eve service. It's going to be so much fun. Bring your friends, bring your family, ugly Christmas sweaters, or you could go all out and look actually nice. That's fine too. We have, there's two types of people on Christmas Eve service. <laughs> all right. God bless. We love you.